and uh, specifically the difference in how the web server behaves or what the web server needs to do with static and dynamic pages. Uh, to refresh our memory a little bit, static pages are written in HTML and again they might include CSS and JavaScript too but for the most part we, part, we talk about those as being HTML files. They may contain links to other files or whatever, but for the most part they're HTML files. And these are unchanged, maybe unchanging is a better word, must be manually changed. Dynamic, on the other hand, means that change based on circumstances. And we talked about a number of different circumstances that would be relevant here. We talked about the time of day could be relevant. All right. Um, you, you visit uh, a, a, television sta a television channel station's uh, website. It's liable to show you what's on now and what's going to be on at 6 o'clock or whatever. Um, if you were to tune in at a different time, it's going to show you what shows are scheduled there. So it's dynamic based on time. Um, it can be dynamic based on user input, as we saw. Uh, when, when you type in something into Google, your, res your, your responses, your results that you get back are different depending on what you typed in. If you go to weather.com, I think it was in the 243 class yesterday. I went to weather.com and I found that the weather here was better than the weather in San Diego, which is probably the only time that will ever happen in my lifetime. All right. But if we go to weather.com, find out if we're getting a hurricane or earthquake or whatever. How many of you felt the earthquake, by the way, yesterday? Yeah, I, I had no idea. When, when did it happen even? Two o'clock? Okay. I might have been napping at two. <laughs> that explains a lot. <laughs> I, I have felt, I, I mean, I've felt earthquakes before we've had one or two, you know, uh, in, in the past, but I, I didn't feel that one. Let's see. Yeah, I, I very well could have been dozing. Yeah, I thought that uh, uh, the, the first earthquake I felt, um, I thought, you know how sometimes like if, you, if you're in your house and like a real big truck goes by, you're, the windows sort of rumble a little bit, uh, and, and maybe, maybe you feel a little shaking. The first earth earthquake I was in, I thought that's what was going on until I realized I was like in the ninth floor of a building, and I thought that would have to be some truck to shake, <laughs> to shake the stuff up here. All right, anyhow, here's weather.com. And if we, uh, if we go in and we type in a different zip code, the results page is different, depending on what we type in. Sunny and 85 here. If we were to type in Boston, let's say, we get... A different result. It's cloudy in 77. People watching the videos at home are going to think we live in the nicest weather place in the world because every time I do a weather example, our weather is better than, than the weather of uh, what I'm comparing it up against. So, uh, Yeah, right, right. If I do this towards the end of the semester, that'll set them straight. Right, right. At any rate, it can be dynamic based on any number of different factors. And we drew a little diagram last time that showed sort of the model of dynamic pages versus static pages. The, the, the static model is barely worth drawing because it's so straightforward. In the case of a static web page, the client asks for it, the server finds it, and delivers it. 
That's it. All right. The pages are already made. They're sitting out there waiting. The server doesn't have to do any thinking or any processing to get them ready to go. They're already ready to go. And the analogy I gave last time would be like if you go into McDonald's. You know, they typically have racks of, of their their food. You know, especially during during a, their peak times. And you go and order a Big Mac. They don't make the Big Mac for you. They just pull a Big Mac. It's already made and hand it to you. So that would be sort of the methodology with static pages. With dynamic pages, things get a little more involved, but the extra complexity adds tons of value. All right. In the case of a dynamic page, there's a script or a recipe. All right, instructions that the server has on how to create the results web page. And the server can take into account any number of different things, or rather these scripts can take into account any number of things. It can take into account user input. Well, we saw that when we went to weather.com, right? Depending on the city that I typed in, it gave me the appropriate weather. The web server might interact with the database. All right, there may be information stored in the database relating to, uh, to the creation of the page. A good example of that, of both of these in action, will be when you log into Angel. Right? When you log into Angel, you supply your username and password, and on the next page pops up a list of the classes that you're enrolled in. Well, there are two ingredients in putting together that page. First of all, it looked at your user ID and password, made sure that those were valid by checking in a database, all right. Once it made sure that you were valid and you were who you said you are, it went out and grabbed a list of your classes and then takes all that stuff and pieces together a web page distinct for you. So if I go and log on, my web page will look different than yours or the person next to you's web page is likely to look different from yours as well. A couple important things to remember that whether it be a static page that's pre-written and sitting out there and waiting to be delivered, or a dynamic page, what gets delivered to the client is the same thing. A combination of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. What do you think there are more of out on the internet? Are there more static sites or dynamic sites? Dynamic. In fact, Think of a famous website. You know, think of a website that you use often. I would be real surprised if anyone could name a, a truly 100% static site that they visit often. You know, like to buy stuff online and go to eBay. Well, that's dynamic, right? Uh, you go to Amazon. Well, that's dynamic. You think they have three billion web pages out there? No, they have a database of their items and it produces those pages on the fly. Um, you're going to school, so you log on to Angel. Well. We already talked about how that's dynamic. Um, like to be on Facebook, that's dynamic, right? You can update your own page by posting your status. All right? It takes that status, stores it in a database somewhere, and then uses that status to create your page. So almost anything um, of consequence on the web is done via dynamic pages. I used to have it as, a, as an assignment, it might have been in this class or it might have been in another class, I used to have as an assignment to name two or three dynamic pages or, or two or three static pages. It became where students couldn't really come up with two or three static pages. Anything you think of probably has at least some piece that's somewhat dynamic. If you can search the site, well, that's a little bit of dynamic stuff. So to really find a pure static site it, it's tough. Uh, the only ones that you're apt to find might be a small site that someone pops up for a small local business that just has like maybe their hours and uh, you know and uh, you know their location and stuff like that. Now, sometimes people tell us, well, why do I need to learn HTML then if if uh, if these static sites aren't aren't prevalent? Well, you learn HTML because it's still important. You won't be writing the HTML, or you won't completely be writing the HTML, but you'll be writing programs to write the HTML. All right? 
Uh, so you will be still writing some HTML because even on dynamic pages there's parts of it that remain the same, that remain static, but you'll be writing code to produce the HTML. So if these pages are done in HTML, what are these server-side scripts in? They're in a variety of different platforms. All right. Server-side scripts in this class we'll be using PHP for them. Um, another big technology is ASP.NET. Another one is Java, Java Enterprise, I think the latest name of it is. Used to be called J2EE. -E. Um, Perl is not per Perl is an older programming language. Python, Ruby on Rails. There's a set of technologies, and all of them do the same thing. All right, on a conceptual level, PHP and ASP.NET do the same thing. I, you know, if you go on a high enough level. Now, to be sure, the details are much different, but. On a conceptual level, they all serve the role of allowing the web server to read user input, interact with databases, and do other sorts of processing to dynamically create an HTML page on the fly that gets, spent, that gets sent back to the client. Okay, questions about this part? All right, now. We're going to continue the food analogy in talking about JavaScript. All right. Let's say you know we hit the lottery, so we don't have to eat fast food. All right. We're not going to go to Wendy's or McDonald's. We're going to go, go to an actual sit-down restaurant. All right. Go to an actual sit-down restaurant, and you place your order. What the waiter is liable to bring to you is a little—I don't know what you'd call it. Little little carrier, little basket, or whatever you want to call it, that has things like salt, pepper, ketchup, mustard. Okay, we're not going to that fancy of a restaurant, all right? But it, we're sitting down at least. We're moving up a little bit, all right? So the waiter comes and they put that on your table for you. Why does the waiter do that? Why why do they leave you with some of their resources? Salt to save time. To save time. To save whose time? To save the waiter's time. Who else's time does it save? Yeah, our time. The diner's time, right? It's a classic win-win situation. Because imagine, if you will, a world where they didn't put the bottle of ketchup on your, on your, uh, on your table. And you ordered some fries, and you got the fries, and you look, oh, wait a minute, I need some ketchup for them. So you raise your hand, you flag the waiter down, the waiter comes, brings you the ketchup, you squirt some on, the waiter takes the bottle of ketchup back and puts it in the kitchen. You know, you start eating and it's pretty tasty ketchup, so you end up eating more of it than you thought and you're about halfway done and you still need a little bit more ketchup, you know? And so on and so on and so forth. Who's going to be getting annoyed by that process? Both of you are, <laughs> right? Because the waiter has pardon the pun, bigger fish to fry, right? The waiter, all right, has things that only the waiter can do. I guarantee you're as good as anyone in the world as far as squirting ketchup on your fries, right? It's not a particularly skilled task. It doesn't require a great chef to do that, all right? It doesn't require a lot of skill or a lot of culinary expertise. You can do that, and in fact, you can do it better because, number one, you know how much you like. Number two, you want it when you want it. You don't want to have to wait for someone to come and do it for you. You can do it just as well as anyone else, and if you do it, the advantage is that you get it done immediately. The waiter, of course, you know, has dishes to deliver to other places and has things that really only the waiter can do. And if the waiter is running around trying to handle both bringing, you know, taking orders and bringing plates to the tables and worrying about whoever has fries going and putting a little squirt of ketchup on their, on their plate, then the waiter is really going to get overworked and overdone. All right? So by putting that ketchup on there, all right, 
it is a win-win situation. Now, before someone yells out, who cares? You know, according to the syllabus, you're entitled to. Let's bring it back to web development. In web development, we're not talking about catch-up or salt. We're talking about code. We're talking about snippets of code, snippets of functionality. Let's look at a classic piece of functionality that's implemented via JavaScript. Uh. Okay. Interesting. Let's go and look at this. First of all, nothing up my sleeves. I didn't even put the zip code in and it tells me that in Elyria, Ohio, it's fair in 85. How do you suppose it managed that? Based on your IP address, it has a pretty good idea of where you're coming from. On occasion, it's going to be wrong about that. All right. I remember for the longest time, <laughs> whenever I'd go to Google, it would direct me to like Google Germany. It would direct me to Google.de. There must have been a flaw in the algorithm or a flaw somehow where it thought that I was there. And I've also, because I my my, uh, my internet through Century, which I think is headquartered in Louisiana, every now and then it tells me that I'm in Louisiana. All right, um, which is confusing for a while. Then I remember, wait a minute, I'm in Ohio. All right, I haven't moved or anything, and I'm, I'm back okay. So that's a case of this page being dynamic. It didn't require user input. It required the server to, to examine the request in a little more detail and pluck out of that request the IP address it's coming from, do some sort of lookup or calculation or whatever it does, and determine where you're located. This, by the way, I think is going to be a growing trend in, uh, in, in, in web sort of things. I, I remember, and I don't remember exactly when it happened, but I remember when I first started noticing that Google was location aware. Right? You do a search for hamburger joint, and it shows you the one down the street. You know what? That's the most ham popular hamburger joint in the world? No, it knows it's the one that's closest to you. All right? So it, it gives you that. All right. At any rate, that is done on the server side. The classic functionality that's done on the client side is this. As I put my mouse over the different links, that submenu changes. All right. We'll call those links on the top, home, US, world, politics, we'll call that the main navigation, and we'll call the, the thing in gray uh, the sub-navigation. As I put my mouse over that, JavaScript allows the proper sub-navigation to display. Now, how do I know that this is done via JavaScript? How do I know that this isn't some sort of server-side thing? Yes? Because it's not going Back to the site. It's right. Right. We know it for a couple reasons. First of all, notice that when you go to another page, even on a quick connection like this, there's a little bit of flicker, right? And I should bite my tongue when I say quick connection because it's actually not connecting that quick. But you notice that even if you're on a, 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 a breathtakingly speedy connection, there's a little bit of flicker as it refreshes the page. You can see the page being wiped out. You can also, if you pay real close attention to the status bar in the bottom of the browser, you can see that it's going up against the server. Whereas you do not see that when it goes there. And it happens immediately. All right. Uh, notice how long it took to click business and go to that. You know, five, ten seconds, let's say. Probably like more like two or three, you know, you really get impatient uh, these days. But notice when you put your mouse on that, happens immediately. Code that is running on this machine 
is going to provide much quicker responses than code that's running out on the web server. Why? Because it doesn't have to travel all the way through the internet to get to the web server and then send the information back. Okay? So, what do we have going on here? What we have going on here is this. When you go to MSNBC, you get some HTML, and you get some HTML that you don't see right away. If we were to do a view source, in fact, let's go and do that. All right. We'll look for the phrase, looked appalled. Yeah, it still should find it. Hmm. Okay. There's another possibility, which we'll get to in a minute here, what could be going on here. In many cases, if this were done via JavaScript, you would see as part of the source code, you would see all those different sub-navigations. Uh, we'll talk about what the alternative might be in, in, in a couple minutes here as we, as we finish out our overview. So, the secret to this sort of mouse over menu is that when you make a request to the server, you get back a bunch of HTML some of which is set to invisible via the CSS. All right? What role does CSS provide on web page? CSS provides appearance uh, characteristics of a page. So HTML is the content, CSS is the appearance. Well, whether it, something appears or not appears is certainly an aspect of its appearance. All right? So, in other words, when we go to a site that has these mouse over windows, we get all the HTML for everything, including the submenus. Now, again, this specific one is possible they're doing AJAX for, which we'll talk about in a minute. But in uh, a standard or more traditional model, all the HTML would be given to us, and the CSS would make some of it visible, some of it invisible. Well... What controls then what's visible and what's invisible and what allows us to interact with the page and change it? That's where the JavaScript comes in. All right? JavaScript allows for interactivity without going back to the server. All right? It's probably the best definition that I could give for client-side scripting. And the wins uh, by using JavaScript, they're similar to the winds of putting the salt, pepper, and ketchup on your, on your uh, uh, table. It's a win-win situation. The server, the waiter slash server, is not bothered by these small little requests that you can do as well as, as he or she can. All right? And you're happier because you don't have to wait for the waiter to come over. You don't have to wait for the server to do it for you. You can do it yourself so you can do it immediately. All right. So that's sort of JavaScript in a nutshell. JavaScript as its interactivity. Now, there's always a couple catches, right? What's the fine print with JavaScript? The fine print with JavaScript is this. Number one, it would either be impossible or impractical or undesirable to let JavaScript do everything on a page. Right? Do I want code living on the client that can connect to my database and do stuff? No. It's probably not possible. If it is possible, it's certainly not desirable. Right? You wouldn't want to expose how to connect to your database through code that lives on the client. Remember, when the user requests this, they get a copy of those files on their machine. 
and I wouldn't want any sort of secure sort of information be sent via that. All right. So even if you could, you wouldn't want to interact with the database um, via JavaScript. And there's a number of other sort of pieces of functionality that you just plain wouldn't want to do on the client even if you could. The other thing to realize is you really don't know what the client is on the other end. The client could be a powerful machine or the client could be my Nintendo DS, right? So you don't necessarily want to put intensive processing on the client because you don't know what sort of machine's running there, you know? So for the real heavy lifting, it's best to do that stuff in, uh, or rather, on the server side. So database interactivity, interacting with other systems, that sort of thing, all right, um, is probably best done on the server. All right, what's best done on the client? Little pieces of interactivity that affect the way an already loaded page looks. So the mouse over menus are one. Uh, little galleries where you click on the thumbnail and you see the, a bigger copy of the image. That would be another good example for JavaScript. There's another huge advantage, or I'm sorry, disadvantage or potential drawback with JavaScript. And that is that it can be disabled by the user. The user can go in and by clicking the right settings in, in their preferences, uh, they can disable JavaScript. All right. Okay, so this, what I would have up here, I would call the traditional model of web applications. All right. Server providing either, either static pages or dynamic pages that get sent to the client the client gets, no matter what sort of page it is, the client gets a mix of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And JavaScript adds a bit of interactivity to the page. Uh, a lot of potentially visual effects and changing uh, the way the page looks without having to go back through the whole process of the server. All right? That's the traditional model. And it kind of sounds funny to talk about something in the web world as being traditional. All right, but this is sort of the traditional model. Now, there are some pages on the web that don't follow this traditional model. There's a particular way of the client and server interacting, which is, goes by the name of Ajax. And a good example of that is, if we go to our friends at Google, and we start typing in, whoops. Ah, oh, looky there. You don't see anything. I told my other class I do this on average of three times a week. And I did it once in that class, once today. That means I, between the two classes tomorrow, I'll do it one time. All right, take two. I go to Google. Let's say I want to do a search on PHP. I type in the first P, look what happened. All right. I got a list of all the things that start with P. All right. Planking is so Plank. 10 minutes ago, right? The new thing is to take pictures uh, where it looks like you don't have a head. So like you have, you know, you, you get a picture of you taken from behind where you're leaning forward and then you have your friend standing so it looks like their head came off your body. That's a new thing. I don't know if there's a name for that. I'll have to ask my daughter. Um, headless horsemaning or something like that, I think it's called. All right. At any rate, notice what it did. It pulled up the most popular search terms that start with the letter P. So I start typing, typing in PH. It brings up the most popular terms that start up with PH. P. And then I can go from there. Let's think about this for a second. We can't really explain a page like this in a traditional model. right? This clearly doesn't fit the, the, the traditional model. Why not? 
Why do I know that something funny is going on here? Something that's not traditional. Yes? Because your, your page is changing without it going to the server. Okay. All right. Your page is changing. All right. I can tell by looking. It's not like reloading the page. So my page, my, my already loaded page is changing. All right. Which leads me to believe what? That is being done through what? Client side code or JavaScript. All right. What tips me off though that this probably isn't done exclusively through JavaScript? Yeah, it sure looks like it's hitting a database to find the most popular terms that start with the letter P, right? And I know from what I said before, that code they ain't going to let live on the client. All right, the client is probably not capable of doing that, and if it was, they wouldn't want the client to do that. All right, so it seems pretty obvious that as I'm typing in, it's doing some sort of database interactivity. So, hmm. In one respect, it appears like it's being done via JavaScript because it refreshes part of my page without refreshing the whole page. This looks similar to the mouse over menus, right? The whole page doesn't redraw itself, just a portion of it. If I type in ASP dot, it shows me that. Similar to you know the, 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 the mouse over and the submenu appearing and disappearing. So it looks like JavaScript is handling that part, yet it seems pretty obvious it's probably doing database interactivity. Right? Because if I think through it logically, it's not sending down to the client a list of every possible term that I could search for. Right? If it was purely JavaScript, it would have to do that. Or it would have to let my JavaScript code connect to a database which you can't and don't want to do. So clearly it must be hitting the server. Because of that, it doesn't fit this model. In this traditional model, the server prepares a page, sends it to the client, and the client can manipulate it without going back to the server. Here, it looks like we're doing both. We're getting stuff from the server, and we're updating the page without refreshing the entire page. That, in a nutshell, is Ajax. All right. Let's look at the model for Ajax. And we'll not show static HTML pages because they're no fun. The trick here is in Ajax, two different kinds of requests are made. All right? That's sort of the trick. The first request is just like in traditional web applications. It's a standard HTTP request. An HTTP request is a request for a complete web page. So when we first go to the page, we make an HTTP request. If you notice, you know, that's what it says up here, HTTP Google.com. We made an HTTP request for Google.com server to respond to us. And that will result in the client being sent a complete web page. That is HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. almost wish I had a different color marker here. Oh, do you have one? Okay. Well, I hope it's readable. Thanks. The other kind of request it can make is a different sort of request. Let me 
HTML. Yeah, start from the beginning. An HTTP request is made, and that request includes the URL, it includes any user input, and other stuff, such as the IP address of who's making the request, right? You need to know that, so you need to know who to send it back to, right? And what gets sent back to the client is our standard complete web page. A complete page that consists of these things. Our second kind of request is also made to the server, but it is an XML HTTP request. A different kind of request. With this request, we also specify a URL and user input, but our response is not a complete web page back. All right? Our response is a chunk of data. That's a technical worm word, a chunk. All right? Which is, is more than a, you know, smattering and less than a boatload. All right? So we get a chunk of data back from the server. What happens to that? We know what happens when you get a complete web page. The browser displays that HTML, CSS, and so on. Part of what it was originally delivered is JavaScript that takes a chunk of the data, takes a chunk of data, and updates the current page. All right. So it doesn't get back a whole page. It doesn't get back a web page. It's just delivering a chunk of data. And we already know that JavaScript We've already seen an example of how JavaScript can take an existing page and change how it looks, right? We saw that with the mouse over menus. We know that JavaScript can do things like change the way a page looks without reloading the whole page. So, let's, let's, let's go back to Google. Is that chunk that's coming back, is it in JavaScript? No. No, that chunk coming back can be in any number of different forms. All right? The JavaScript, the code to handle that chunk of data is in JavaScript, and it was loaded when the initial page was loaded. The chunk of data is just the data. It can be uh, in delimited form, so it can be like tab delimited data. It could be comma delimited data. It could be fixed length data, where the first 20 bytes mean something, the next 20 bytes mean something. It could be an XML file, or it could be JSON, J-S-O-N. All right? Those are different, just different formats for data. But the idea is, is all it is is a chunk of data. All right? Could, yeah? What's the format when we do the Google search? What's that coming back at? You would ha one would have to look at Google to see, okay. yeah, to, to see that. We could, we could probably reverse engineer it, right? Because we know we have the JavaScript. Uh, I'll take a minute when I'm done here and see if we can pluck something out. Maybe not. I don't know. Those folks are smart, all right? Uh, but we might be able to guess at least what, what, how it's coming, coming over. All right. Let's narrate this, all right? I go and I type, I type in google.com or http google.com. I got 
All right. I go in and I talk. To the server, it will get back a complete web page that consists of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. The JavaScript that is going to get delivered is going to be the very JavaScript that we're going to use in this formatting step. So it already has loaded the JavaScript to take that chunk of data and display it. Not doing anything with it yet, but it's ready. It's on standby. All right. So we make the request, goes to the server, comes back as a completed web page. We type in a letter. And what displays is the top 10 or so choices, uh, search items that start with that. And again, you tell me that the Akron Beacon Journal is the ninth rank A in the world? No. That's obviously location aware. All right. <laughs> uh, are you trying to say something about what I'm doing instead of working? Or <laughs> uh, at any rate, what happened when I typed that? It didn't request a new, a new web page. It made a XML HTTP request. And it sent the user input. In other words, it sent the fact that in that text box is an A. All right? The Google server did its thing. In addition to looking at the A, it looked at where the request came from to know to put Akron on that list. All right? It came up and it returned a chunk of data. So it returned these items in some format or another. All right. Now, the JavaScript that was already sitting on this web page from the initial load took that chunk of data and formatted this little window here. Again, yeah, based on cookies and all that. Yeah, a lot of lot of things. Uh, you know, there's a lot more going on with these things uh, as they try to improve uh, the, the user experience. And again, if I continue typing that in, I can find my term. Now let's take a quick look and see. The question was raised, what format does that come in? This is going to be hard to tell because if you notice, all those lectures that I give in CISS 216 about properly indenting your code, they must have missed that day. Of course, again, compare the, car, the cars that the guys from Google drive and the car that I drive, and you see, you get a better sense of maybe who missed the boat and who caught it. All right? This is hard to read. And I, yeah. Yeah. Let me ask a question now. Why does Google, why is Google's code so ugly? Why is it all smashed together? Any thoughts? It's hard to understand. Yeah, possibly. Because it wasn't made by hand. Because it wasn't made by hand. That's also a distinct possibility. All the cool Google stuff is, is going on on the server, by the way. Uh, that's a strong possibility as well that a script, someone else was saying something? Smaller file size. Smaller file size, right. How many times do people go and do a Google search? You know, hundreds. All those extra spaces and tabs on their server would add up. All right? Not a big deal if, you're, uh, you know, if your site's getting 100 hits a day, but if your site's getting a billion hits a day, it probably adds up and, and, and becomes something important. All right. Yeah, a lot of this is done via JavaScript, though. That's that's the problem. Well, could it be called for an XML file? Well, I think it's an XML file. If you look at the uh, string, it kind of looks like a text. Yeah. Well, it's not the same. 
Yeah. Turn A dot length. Um, well, I don't know. The only thing that would lead me to believe that it's not XML is the fact that really all it's returning is a set of words. It's not really returning an advanced, an advanced sort of data structure. And if all you're doing is returning a, a, you know, a, a list of words, a, a tab the limited file is going to be way shorter. I remember we, uh, when, when we first, uh, one, one assignment I was on, we first started playing with converting uh, our tab delimited files to XML and really it, it increased the, the data size like by a factor of 10. You know, the XML version of the data was 10 times as big as the tab delimited. Now, if it's complex data and you gain the fact that XML can, can hold a structure, then, then that's okay. But if it's simple data like this, eh, you got to wonder. All right, anyhow, uh, enough for reverse engineering for today. All right, where are we and where do we go from here? <laughs> All right, we've looked at really the main technologies that we're going to cover in this class we, uh, on a conceptual level. All right, this class covers uh, client-side scripting. In fact, that's where we're going to start out. All right, some of you in the 216 class probably have already had a little taste of, of some uh, client-side scripting and when we'll study that in more detail and we'll see how to do interactive stuff. And we'll do that sort of in the traditional mode, not in the Ajax mode. We will then do some PHP server-side scripting and in the last section of the class we pull the two together and do Ajax. It's important that you know both, right? Because both the, the server and the client have a role in Ajax. Um, if you think about it conceptually, the AJAX model lets each entity in that interaction do what it's good at. What are servers good at? Interacting with databases, cranking out data, that sort of thing. What are clients good at? Manipulating and redrawing the UI, right? Redrawing the user interface, redrawing the page. So really, AJAX is, is, is a smarter implementation of the client-server model by playing to the strengths of both sides. All right? Ideally, you don't want your server worrying about the way things look. That should be the client's job. All right? If you talk about uh, in traditional software development, those of you that maybe have had VB or advanced VB or whatever, they talk about multi-tiered applications where each piece worries about its own job. Well, in traditional web applications, the server has to worry about cranking out the data and formatting it in HTML to give to the client. In AJAX, part of that responsibility is shifted over to the client, which is really where it belongs, you know, if you think on a, a tier level. If you haven't had advanced VB or whatever, um, when you're re-watching the lecture, go back and do a search on addicting games and see what it comes up with. All right? My guess is it would come up with Angry Birds and Tetris. I don't know if anyone else has opinions on that. All right. Next time we will start out by examining JavaScript in more detail. Um, we'll study the, the pieces that go into the typical client-side interactive behavior. We'll look at little mouse over menus and that sort of thing and, and we'll go on from there. All right. Any questions? We'll see you over in lab. Oh, here's your pen. Thank you. There you go. Good catch.